Hello. Um, this is going to be a discussion about uh, the president, John Quincy Adams. I read this book recently uh, by Harlow Giles Unger, um, who wrote the book I read about um, James Monroe. Um, so this is about John Quincy Adams, JQA, uh, for those who are in the know. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to discuss this. I don't know how much this is going to be about a book review, um, which is more of a critique on the author's choice of, you know, what he focuses on and more about the discussion about the president himself. So as you may know that John Quincy Adams uh, is the, was the son of John Adams, who was the famous, one of the famous founding fathers. Um, and they were from uh, Braintree, Massachusetts, which later became known as uh, Quincy. I think it was named after Quincy, John Quincy Adams' grandfather, if I remember correctly. Um, so uh, during the, I think he was only about 10 years old when the revolution started. Um, and his father had had to go to France to try to drum up money and support from the French to uh, to fight the British for the independence. And so John Adams decided that he was going to take his son with him. It was, I think he was only about 10 years old, just a schoolboy, and took him with him. And so they basically lived in, in France for uh, a few years, and he, he was put into French uh, sort of boarding schools. Um, and he started learning languages. He started learning the classics. Um, and, you know, he ended up throughout his childhood, he ended up living in, in, in Russia for a little bit, in France, uh, in Holland. Uh, and then after the war, when John Adams was negotiating the peace between the British and the Americans, they lived in England. Um, his father was obviously very heavily uh, involved in the revolution and, uh, American politics and international relations. And um, so John Quincy Adams, I mean, his whole childhood was basically following his father around, learning new languages, learning uh, new customs. And so it, he spent most of his childhood abroad. And so it's, I think later in life, he would suffer from this because he would, he was not seen as somebody who was in, in connection with the common man in America. Um, and he actually traveled around with a, a guy, Francis Dana, who was one of the, the, they would call them ministers to a country, but we would call them ambassadors today uh, in, in Russia and in Germany, and basically learning the ropes of how to be a diplomat and how to uh, maybe get, you know, he made friends with the, the um, uh, later on, he became pretty good friends with um, uh, Tsar Alexander of uh, Russia which is kind of weird, you know, that they would just hang out because uh, the Russian aristocracy uh, preferred to speak French amongst themselves, that Russian was kind of considered like a peasant language. And they kind of fancied themselves as being sophisticated Europeans who just happened to be running a backwards country. Um, and so they spoke French amongst themselves. Um, and so, I mean, you know, a lot of his childhood was basically just, it was just a... a a course in in how to be a diplomat, how to, to, to get what you want from the country and send back information about Russia or Prussia or whatever. And, you know, he became you know, an ambassador in Holland uh, and Russia and Prussia and the United Kingdom. Uh, and then he decided he wanted to come back. His, his wife, um, Louisa, was actually uh, the daughter of an American businessman who had been living in England for a long time. And uh, so she was kind of seen as foreign, even though they, technically she was American, uh, of an American family, but she never really spent a lot of time in America. So uh, maybe didn't have those sort of, especially Massachusetts, puritanical roots, you know, maybe through the parents, but it might have been watered down uh, having lived in England. And since in the English kind of, get rid of these people. And that's the beginning of America. Um, she was always kind of seen as foreign by a lot of people in, uh, in America. And she really just didn't really didn't latch on to any place that she lived in in America, be it in Massachusetts, 
or you know any place she went in like New York, Philadelphia, and even Washington. Uh, when they later settled there, she just hated the place. I mean, I can understand a little bit. The weather in Washington, D.C. during the summertime is absolutely horrible. It is so humid. It is basically a giant swamp, and they did, obviously didn't have air conditioning. So I can sympathize with that. But he became, when he came back, he joined the, he ran for Massachusetts, the Massachusetts legislature, um, which is the Massachusetts House. And... That's how they decided that you didn't elect senators directly in those days. You basically, the, the House would then decide who would they would send to Washington. And so he became a um, senator from Massachusetts. And he actually brought up a lot of interesting points. He was actually, he gave a lot of good speeches, drew heavily from the classics he had learned over the years, particularly they talk about Tacitus or, um, who was a Roman historian. So learning about people like Tiberius and Caligula and, and Nero, um, Claudius especially, those are important lessons to learn because you learn the personalities that, that you know, the tendencies are, I won't go too far, this is not a lesson in, in Tacitus, but you learn a lot about the personalities that are involved in the Caesars, you know, particularly in that, um, Augustan uh, dynasty. Um, and so anyway, he was actually very successful at this. And under, uh, during the time of uh, the, um, the presidency of James Monroe, uh, James Madison, James Monroe was actually the Secretary of State. Um, and now this was a very it, unlike today where you kind of see the, the vice president is like the second most powerful uh, position in the American government secretary of state was kind of like like the like the on deck circle of a baseball game for the president this is the next guy that the president wants to be there because it's basically it's training him on how to be an executive um, while the vice presidency is kind of a useless job a sinecure where you just kind of sit around and not do anything it, in those days the the vice president was the loser of the first loser of the uh election so if you got second place you became vice president and you know you basically just sat you were forced to sit there staring at the president like i should be in that spot you know because you ran against them um they didn't run together until a little bit later so anyway uh, James Monroe becomes president and he picks uh, John Quincy Adams to be Secretary of State. Now this means a lot of it is sending, you know, dealing with the, the American policy towards other countries and then particularly at a very, you know, right after the War of 1812, so this would be um, two or three years after the War of 1812, which actually ended in 1814. Um, he was forced to, you know, he became president and he pretty much won unopposed no, because, I mean, this you can read about James Madison or James Monroe is that the guy was an absolute legend in every category. He was very well educated. He went to Princeton, um, but he was also uh, a soldier and was a very good soldier. And he basically... I wouldn't say single-handedly won the War of 1812, but all of all of Washington was absolutely panicked, and he was the only one who kept his cold because he had been in war. He had he had fought in the Revolution under under Alexander Hamilton and George Washington. He knew how to keep his cool, um, and so he becomes Secretary of State, um, and. At this point, he is basically there. He, he and, and Monroe come up with the Monroe Doctrine, which is essentially uh, the policy that America still holds to this day. I think it's slightly antiquated in the fact that nobody actually, this is not something that's ever really brought up anymore because it's so permanent that it's just kind of questioning. Yeah, it's like Philadelphia. Is it part of America? Are we going to leave? No, we're never going to leave. We're the home of America. You know, so it's like it goes without saying the Monroe Doctrine is American policy and it has been for over the last, you know, 200 years is essentially that 
America was never going to let a foreign power come and establish any new colonies. They weren't going to mess with the established colonies. But at this time, the Spanish were really trying to sort of turn the screws on the American or the Latin American countries that were in full scale revolt against them. And the United States was actively encouraging them in this because they basically wanted parts of North America for themselves. And the Spanish had their fingers everywhere in Florida, in Mexico, out West in California and in the Caribbean. And the, the, the Americans just wanted the Spanish gone. And if, you know, if they get sort of, their army gets dilapidated in the process of fighting all these revolutions, then they're not able to hold on to places like Florida and Texas and Mexico. Um, and so this was an era, it was called the era of good feelings, where essentially uh, Monroe was just, he was loved. Um, but at some point he tried so hard to emulate George Washington by not holding very partisan views about things. He was obsessed with the idea of bringing the country together, which is essentially a good thing, but you have to have some kind of like ethos. You have to have some kind of um, ideology, at least guiding you. You don't have to be a slave to it, but you at least have to be connected to it. This is the way I approach certain topics, you know. And when Man uh, Monroe's two, year or two terms were up, in the election of 1824, he wanted Jane, uh, John Quincy Adams to become president, but he, since he wanted to emulate Washington so much, he refused to openly support uh, Adams. And essentially, Adams, he had to struggle for this. And since there was no clear, a clear majority winner in the, uh, the election of 1824, the... Uh, the election had to be decided by the House of Representatives and some deals were done and John Quincy Adams was named president. Um, and this really pissed off Andrew Jackson because he felt like he had been cheated. Um, people were really scared of Andrew Jackson because he was known as a hothead and was running around, you know, basically, is he going to come into this? Because he apparently he always had pistols on him. <laughs> and he would come into a room and people were like, is he going to, what's he going to do? And apparently he just congratulated uh, Adams and then made his life hell afterwards by uh, essentially just drumming up support in the South against Adams as a president. And so this was the end of uh, the era of good feelings that Ad, uh, Jackson had, um, since Jackson was not going to go along with what Adams wanted. Um, and to be fair, in Jackson, in the end, was right about a lot of things. Um, but so was was, was Adams. It, it, you kind of look through this, and, and maybe I'll get into this when we go into the Jackson, because Jackson ended up being president later. Um, Jackson was very, I mean, he, he was a general, or I don't know his official rank, in the... Uh, the War of 1812. He had fought, he had laid his life down on the line for the country. Adams basically was playing games with kings over in Europe. I mean, that's the difference. And he did not respect Adams. He thought he was just some kind of, you know, spoiled little kid whose dad was president. And he was given life, you know, a great life to him on a silver platter. And, you know, to be fair to, to, to Jackson, he was absolutely right about that, that um, while Adams was a very intelligent man and very thoughtful and wise, at least in everything he had done at that point, as senator, secretary of state, ambassador, he was did not become a very good president because he had no connection for the people. He did not, he was not able to represent the country as a whole. Um, he only represented his limited worldview of a bookworm who lived in, in Paris, in Amsterdam, in St. Petersburg, in London. He had no connection to farmers out in the middle of nowhere, Virginia. Um, and it was very clear because he would just, and he had no spine for politics. He could give speeches, but he didn't really 
he would just let these people walk all over him. Um, and it just kind of, I know that I'd done a couple of videos previous to this about um, Rudyard Kipling, obviously Rudyard Kipling many years after this, but he, Adams kind of lacked this ability to what Rudyard Kipling says, if you can walk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings, or lose the common touch is that quite literally he was a very good friend to Alexander the king as the czar of Russia but he just could not connect with the average man who might have been illiterate who might not have read Tacitus or even heard of Tacitus um and he just he was not a very good president he um he wasn't very persevering he would get frustrated and just mope around the white house and his wife louisa was just sick of him and then basically she wanted him i don't think she and in the book it's not openly stated but she did not like living in the white house um having to entertain everyone um because he was not a very social guy i mean especially with people that you have to ingratiate yourself to people that you might not like um and so during his presidency, I would say that he continued um, Monroe's, you know, the Monroe Doctrine, um, in which he kind of co-wrote. Um, and the other thing of note during his presidency was the Missouri Compromise, is that essentially Missouri, uh, which is in the Midwest, wanted to enter into the Union, stop being a territory, and become a state, which means they had a state constitution, they applied for it. The thing is that there was a balance between the number of slave states and the number of free states in the United States. That's a lot of S's there. <laughs> but um, people were, they, you, it was kind of like an unwritten rule not to talk about slavery in federal politics because the North just didn't understand the South. The South just didn't understand the North. And they kind of like an old couple who just doesn't really talk about things. They just kind of let it, things fester. Um, they basically just didn't want to talk about it. And so essentially they, after a little bit of hammering out details, they came to the Missouri Compromise that essentially any new state that comes to the Union has to be accompanied by another state. So Missouri went into the Union as a slave state, but Maine went into the Union as a, slave, as a free state. And so these... They basically, they would do one for one, one for one. And, it, and the slave states had to be below the 36th uh, parallel, 36, 30 parallel, and essentially um, basically limiting the, the slavery to the South. Um, and they think the North that had to be free. I don't think this was technically written into law, but it became a convention for the next 30 years. And obviously didn't always work out that way. So uh, in 1820, uh, in 1828, he loses the election to Andrew Jackson, basically because he was a kind of do-nothing president. He was stymied at every step of the, of the way by people who were very loyal to Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson becomes president. Uh, and Adams just decides he's going to go back to Massachusetts, relax, just hang out, enjoy the rest of his life. And then someone ends up convincing him to become uh, a congressman because, you know, somebody else had been retiring. They say, well, why don't you go back to Washington? You, you, you were a good senator. You were a good, you know, representative of our, of our state. And the family were not happy. Louisa just did not want to go back to Washington because politics really brought out the worst in his sort of, I would call like reading this as depressive mentality is very intelligent, but if he gets frustrated, he gets depressed. I understand um, quite personally. And Washington at the time was a bit of a dump. It was not like this big city like it is today. It's actually, it was actually just, there weren't any roads or rats everywhere. There was mud because it rained all the time. And it was just not a fun place to be. Um, and so when he gets there, he basically, there was this new concept of state sovereignty going around. Uh, essentially, he's attacking it as treason. was like, look, we have a supremacy clause in the Constitution. You can do things that are not expressly written in the Constitution, but if they are, and, and there is a law based on that, then the, the federal government is supreme. Um, and... 
this is you can see the I mean because we're obviously many many years after the fact as we can see this is sort of the beginning of the Civil War, um, maybe like the ideological beginnings, uh, and he was trying to push as a congressman trying to so this is like the first time this guy most people would just retire after having lost the big he just decided to jump right back into politics and pushing for public improvements including like roads highways and things like that to build up commerce because if you build up commerce you get more money you get more secure you get more stable and then you know you never know if the british are going to come back for a third try um or you never knew if the spanish were going to be you know planning anything uh, the French at this point had pretty much were out of the picture, but you never know. You know, they still had a couple, they still have to this day a couple places in uh, the Caribbean. So you never know who you're going to have to fight. And if you have a united front, you have, you're well, you know, really well armed, then fine. You might be able to, to stand a chance. And that was the whole point uh, of the, the instability in the early days of the United States is that we, we're not really sure if we're going to be around for a while. Um, so in Congress, Adams starts talking about abolition openly, um, which was really good for people in Massachusetts and in Pennsylvania who are very like religiously opposed to slavery, but it really pissed off the South. Um, there were all kinds of nullification conventions where places like South Carolina tried to undo federal tariff laws and they accused the federal government as well as northern states of interfering with uh southern com uh, commerce by essentially there was one congressman uh in the book whose name i don't remember uh basically saying like look in, in the south slaves are our machinery and you're trying to destroy our commerce which is morally incorrect but economically it's well you would probably call him chattel um but um yeah they are kind of the, the what the economy worked on um so i could see his point obviously with hindsight we would say this is a morally abominable position to call them just pieces you know slaves as pieces of machinery instead of humans uh which would technically be labor but they weren't treated as labor um uh so and then you know You've had places like Georgia and South Carolina and real, Virginia really kind of drumming up this sort of anti-North rhetoric and very slightly secessionist um, talk. And a guy like Andrew Jackson, who was very popular in this place, had to kind of crack, crack the whip on him because this is like it's bordering on treason because you're essentially trying to secede. And Jackson didn't like where this was going because as i said before he had basically risked his life time and time again for the unity and the preser uh, preservation of the country and he was very very probably one of the most purely pro-american in the the absolute sense of any of the these um presidents at the time the first six seven presidents um and it was kind of jarring to the southern states. I thought, oh, I thought you were our guy, and then suddenly you're 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 basically cracking a whip on us. Um, and it was at this time that a guy, a British man, apparently left a hundred thousand pounds to the United States, like just on, in his will, and saying, "I want the U.S. to establish some sort of institutional organization, um, just to further." You know, people were, 1800s was really a big science era. You had people like Michael Faraday, you know, Benjamin Franklin was the, the 1700s, but you really had a real big push for people studying things, the stars, the, the, the earth, you know, chemistry, biology, things like this. So you left all this money to the United States to do something with it. And Adams was like, well, why don't, why don't we establish a national university? And at the time, the former president or vice president, uh, Calhoun, said, well, you know, this is against the Tenth Amendment, that essentially that this is a state thing to do. Obviously, with the Land Grant Act under, I think it was Jefferson, basically, he's like, we will allow the states to do this, we will encourage them, but we can't do it at a federal level. Um, so uh, 
he basically was trying. He had, uh, later on ended up pushing for uh, giving a lot of money to Harvard. Um, he actually helped establish the what would later be I forget the original name, but it was later to become George Washington University in uh, in Washington D.C. And he was so associated with science that one of the first people to have a his picture taken in the United States was John Quincy Adams by one of those daguerreotype um, cameras. If you see, they're in this sort of brownish sepia tone. Uh, people are very frowny in them back those days, but there's a picture of him in there, um, which is quite interesting. And this is many years after he was president. And um, uh, another thing that he got noticed for was that he, uh, at the time, the politics were so childish. You think it's bad today. It was horrible back then. Uh, the guy who later became president, Polk, uh, who was only, I think he was from Tennessee, um, he, he basically said, I will only speak to Southern gentlemen. So that means anybody from the North, anybody who comes from a common background, uh, which later would be somebody like famous, like Abraham Lincoln was known as just like a dirt farmer from Kentucky. Uh, originally, uh, he wouldn't talk to them, you know, and it, it was just, uh, it's just absolutely amazing. And it just makes you think people have always been crappy towards one another in American politics. And if you, I read a, a book by, about um, um, Edmund Burke recently, it's the same thing. People were, are just crappy to one towards one another and they need to be constantly reminded to be good to one another. Um, I, I suppose the last thing I would talk about is, um, well, I mean, going on with those childish things, there was a gag rule basically saying banning people from actually saying the word, uttering the word slavery in anything and just speaking about slavery, using the word slavery. This is why a lot of the, the terms at the time were called like involuntary, uh, uh, involuntary servitude or they would really kind of dance around it if they had to make a bill proposing something involving even if it were pro-slavery they had to kind of dance around the term and it just kind of goes to show that they can just be so silly uh and the last thing i'll talk about i won't talk about his death basically he died while he was still congressman but he got associated with this ship called the amistad and the story behind this was that a ship went over to um africa kidnapped a bunch of Africans, including a, a tribal king, and then they didn't care, and they just brought them back and they were gonna be sold as slaves in Cuba. Now, the thing is that on the way over to Cuba, the king, uh, you know, this, this tribal king, organizes his people to revolt against the people these sort of slavers you can call them basically the, the sailors of the ship and they kill the entire ship now the problem beyond that is that once they had killed everybody on the ship that was a slaver they didn't know how to sail a giant ship and so they ended up just drifting into american waters and at this point they get captured um and the government has to decide what to do with them. And there are all these court cases essentially going back and forth about who, what to do with these people. And John Quincy Adams ended up being a lawyer and arguing in front of the Supreme Court about the Amistad saying, look, these people were kidnapped. They, this is, the, I read this. I was like, this sounds like Julius Caesar. Um, where he was, Julius Caesar was kidnapped. This king, his name was, they called it in the book Sank or Cinque, I think, um, like five. Um, and he organizes a revolt and kills his slavers, exactly what um, uh, Julius Caesar did. And uh, so the, 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 the ship just kind of drifts into American water. And I just thought that was a really interesting story. So... John Quincy Adams ends up defending them to the Supreme Court, and eventually they're let off. And they're basically saying that they were kidnapped. They had every right to revolt against their captors. It was not murder. In fact, it was probably you know a, a good thing to do. And 
the president at the time, so we've moved on from Jackson to Van Buren, who was his um, um, successor, he kind of ignored the case. Now, Van Buren was from New York. Um, it actually is interesting. He's like the only president whose native language is not English. I think it was he was his native language was Dutch becomes there's there was a fair amount of Dutch people still speaking uh, Dutch in the rural parts of, of uh, New York. Anyway, he ends up trying to ignore this because he didn't want to piss off the South, but he knew that this case was probably it was defending the indefensible to take up the other side of it. Um, and essentially, you know, the, the guys who Sherman and, and John Quincy Adams, the guys who pleaded the case, uh, were completely vilified throughout the South. Um, but the Africans were freed and they were sent home to where they were. I think it was from the Congo. Um, so essentially, you get the idea that John Quincy Adams was good at just about everything that he did except for being president. And I don't know it's because he was a little too naive to be president, but I don't think that's true because he was very, very capable as a diplomat and you cannot be naive as a diplomat. However, I don't think that he had this self-preservation gene or instinct that a lot of politicians, and I've heard it being termed as the killer instinct. He sort of just fell into the presidency because he became, he was, Secretary of State, and that's where presidents were found, or you know, they they were groomed at the time. So it's interesting to, to to he just kind of bumbled his way into it because technically the, he just sort of rose to throughout the ranks of of the of the State Department to the point where he became the head of it, and he was so good at it, and the pop and the president he was under was so popular, they just said, yeah, more of that. And so there's like, he's suddenly president, he's terrible at it, he hates the job, his wife hates him for taking the job, and he's miserable the whole time, he basically just sits there and sulks the whole four years he's president. But he's good at everything else. It's, it's just, it's an interesting guy. I think that I would actually like the guy um, it's just that he he had some very um, very very strong points, um, but his flaws make him a terrible uh, terrible politician who, for getting what you want. So anyway, that's uh, John Quincy Adams in a nutshell. Um, so I guess I'll be reading about Andrew Jackson next, um, and I will talk to you then. See ya.